Where is everybody? I was beginning to think I had the wrong time and day. <laughs> uh oh, where is everybody? It's, it's not eight o'clock yet. All right, we'll give nine. You know what? Let me let me post and remind. Maybe people just are all forgetting. Take one off and. <laughs> oh no. Oh, they're coming, Debbie. They're coming. Okay. <laughs> How are you? Hello. Hello. I was just telling Debbie that I was I was getting nervous that if we took one week off for Thanksgiving, everyone would forget to come back. It's nice to see everybody. Nice to see you. How was everyone's Thanksgiving? Wonderful. Nice. How about yours? It was very nice. We are in a pod with my first cousins who live here and their family. And we always have Thanksgiving with them, but usually they have like 25 people. And this year we were the nine or 10 of us. Oh, um, yeah. But it was, you know, in some ways it was nicer. <laughs> a, a little less. <laughs> We still had pumpkin pie and cookie, so we were pretty happy. Great. Is it cold in Chicago? Uh, yeah, it's in the 30s. It's cloudy. It's Chicago. it's winter. <laughs> Your screen just summed up the debate at our show. Like some people are saying that right now it's supposed to be 45 and rainy over the weekend, that that's like too cold. And some people, I'm from New England, so I'm like, that's not cold. You don't know cold. <laughs> it's winter. This is what it does. Yeah, <laughs> Chicago is cold. I don't know. We lived in Boston. We thought Boston was cold too. Yes, it is. My mom, who's from Chicago, said Boston gets, it has like spurts of cold like you'll get like a few big nor'easters over the winter and that like her memory of chicago is it was just like steadily two inches of snow on the ground all winter long um i don't know we found boston to be very damp and cold too really so. yeah it's winter that. you you put on a coat and <laughs> right you have your hot cocoa you bend a lot You're if you don't like it you move <laughs> you move to florida let's, let's... where it's too hot where it's too hot mm. i'm gonna get some But New York, perfect weather, right? <laughs> well, in New York, everything's dirty and smelly and loud. <laughs> so it just makes every weather more intense. I should have asked if you're from New York before I called it smelly loud. No, and terrible. Okay. no I am not from New York. I sort of like visiting New York. Mm, yes, short bursts. Yeah. Hi, Tammy. How are you? My brother-in-law is from New York. Oh. And he was like, it's the greatest place on earth. It's the greatest place on earth. And then he moved out and said, I can't believe I lived there and thought I liked it. <laughs> it's so funny how people are. I'm, I grew up in Boston, as did my sisters. I'm, what, my middle sister lives in New York, and she's like a New Yorker now. She gave up her driver's license. She, you know, she only operates as a New Yorker. We could not be more different in that, that way. Where are you from, Tammy? Sk did you say Skokie? She did, but she's muted. She is muted. I guessed. I lip read. Sorry. Yeah, I was born and raised in Skokie. Wow. How about you, Jerry? Where are you from? Also muted. He's from muted. <laughs> I am going to have my camera off for most of the evening, so I apologize. Okay. Nice. But I'll be listening. Okay. Amazing. We'll give people one more minute to see if anyone comes. How about you, Barry? Where are you from? Can you unmute easily? Chicago. From where? Chicago. Oh, you're also, uh, yeah, that's, 
it's so funny. There are some places where like people don't leave. It's so nice. I hope that Philadelphia is like that. I want my children to stay. <laughs> Hi, Tamar. I have to say one of the benefits of Zoom is that with everyone's name, I don't have to ever remember anything from week to week. I can just use my cheat sheet. See, there's benefits out there. <laughs> Definitely. My favorite is my compulsion that I can control the pace at which we view my story sheet. That's true. That's true. <laughs> right, teachers see it when you start flipping through and you're like, wait. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was the mute button. I, that's the. <laughs> My husband is, is pacing the kitchen right now. I'm making scones. He's making scones. Maybe he'll learn some Torah on the side. She makes scones. My husband has definitely developed a, like a COVID uh, hobby. He loves making sourdough and now he's like recently started branching out to other baked goods, which are Sweet. delicious, but not terribly good for me. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll get started with who we have here because we have a great uh, group of people. And I will share my screen. I thought we could start if people want to share um, the story of I thought today we would look at Yaakov as our, <laughs> our father and his characteristics that we uh, look at. And I, I think that the story of Yaakov going back um, over the stream into um, a place alone and then battling, wrestling with someone through the night um, and resulting in this change of name is like a, a narrative that often people are familiar with. And so I thought um, if people wanted to share like what they pictured is Yaakov fighting an actual person, the, the Tsar of Esav, right? Like Esav, his brother's emissary, um, Amalach. Is this like a, a figurative fight or a literal fight? Um, I know this is one of those stories often well cemented in people's heads. We don't have to though, if we don't want to. I will say that growing up, I always pictured a literal fight between an angel and Yaakov which I think is maybe like the day school model. Um, and I was surprised to learn that there are so many other lovely ways of thinking about this wrestling. And I think that Yaakov to me feels like one of the more complicated of the Avot, like the more real, the one that you could like see playing on like some, you know, real TV show um, in his behavior. And so there are like lots of complex parts to Yaakov and, um, I think the wrestling is actually one of his more positive attributes or his interest in wrestling. Um, so I don't think we're going to read this whole text, but this is the text of the, the wrestling story and I'll highlight a few pieces. And then I wanted us to look at two different um, psychological interpretations of, um, of who or what Yaakov is wrestling uh, within himself. Um, and to do so, I have condensed like big chapters of books into very small little pieces. So I've developed like a cheat sheet for us to go along with it. So um, the, the scene is that Yaakov has just left Lavan, his father-in-law's house with all of his wives and many children and cattle. And he's preparing to go see Yaakov, uh, Esau, like shortly before uh, Pasuk Kaf Gimel, that's where he tells Esau he's on his way. Um, and they, they cross the stream, but then Yaakov goes back for some unknown reason, um, and he's left alone on the other side of the stream, the, the stream, um, and while he's there, ishimo, that he wrestles with a, a man, an ish, so through the night, Yaakov is in some kind of battle, uh, wrestling match with an ish, um, and then he wins. And when he wins, the angel or the Ish, sorry, see, I'm displaying my preconceived idea about what this is. The Ish says to him, let me go. I have to go. And Yaakov says to him, Lo ashlechech, I'm right here in Kafzayin, um, ki im berech tani. I will not let you go until you bless me, which is like a pretty um, bold thing to say. I think there's a lot to be learned about boldly demanding our, our blessings in life. Um, 
And the man says to him, what is your name? Right, to which Yaakov says, oh, my name is Yaakov. And then the bracha that he gets is the, the man, the ish says to him, Vayomer lo Yaakov amar od, uh, shimcha. no one will call you Yaakov anymore. Ki im Yisrael, ki sarita im elokim v'im anashim v'tuchal. So the, the ish says, now you will be called Yisrael because you have sarita, you have striven with God and with men and you prevailed. And... Um, then at the end, it's Yaakov who really realizes that perhaps he struggled with like some kind of divine piece of himself or of the world, um, because he says that he saw the panim of Hashem. He names the place Peniel for that reason. So the battle is, um, is like tersely written. It's not clear, right? We don't know who the man is. We don't know where they are. We don't know why Yaakov went alone. We, I'm not sure like we totally understand why the name change and why this man gets to be the one to give the name change. Um, and so the, it's open to lots of interpretations in the Midrash and moving forward. Um, and I wanna look particularly at Rabbi Jonathan Sachs following in uh, honoring his memory and legacy this, this month and this year, I'm sure. Um, and then at Aviva Zorenberg, um, because I think they, they take the same approach and they end in very different places and that that is interesting. So to, to read the beautiful punchline of Rabbi Sachs, I'm just gonna catch us up to that place. So this is like the most quick and dirty summary of Rabbi Sachs' chapter, but I think it will, it will bring us hopefully some good conversation and it will bring us to his punchline and that we feel ready to receive it. So Rabbi Sachs' argument is that Yaakov wants to be Esav. Um, and I was talking this over, like sort of practicing bits and pieces with my husband last night. And he smiled and he said, you clearly don't have an older brother. Of course you wanted to be Esav. Um, and it's true. I am the oldest of three sisters. Um, I, you know, I called it sort of hero worship, but I think maybe it's like normal sibling uh, emotion that often the younger child looks up to the older child. And so the, the ways in which Rabbi Sachs interprets that um, are uh, sort of pre-life, there were two, that they struggle, Vidra Tetsu, both of them in the womb. I'm, I'm not totally bought on that that means Yaakov wants to be like Esau, but certainly there's like some kind of uh, interpersonal tension maybe is what, is what Rabbi Sachs is saying. And then that he, he comes out of the womb literally holding on to Esau, like, wait for me, I wanna be with you, right? Um, and then I think the ones that are more compelling in translating to our own lives are um, the, the first, second, and third, or the third, fourth, and fifth, um, where Yaakov tries to take all of the trappings of Esau's life, right? He um, convinces him to sell his birthright. He wears Esau's clothes. He uses Esau's words and his voice to say, I am Esau. And then ultimately he takes Esau's blessing. Um, and I, I said to someone the other day, right? Like when you want to be like someone else, your idol, you know, a few years older than you in school or shul or the mom who looks much more together, like you ask where they bought their clothes and you eat their, the same foods they eat and you work on making your hair look like theirs, right? Like to me, this, this kind of makes sense. Of course, there's a, another totally legitimate way to read the shot. But I think that there's something to be said about perhaps Yaakov is not just trying to steal from Esav, but he really is trying to emulate Esav. I don't know how that sits with people here. Feel free to jump in to challenge or agree or have other ideas of how Yaakov wants to be like Esav. I would say that that's certainly a beautiful way to look at it. <laughs> not yeah. probably like not the norm. It's not anything I've heard before, but it does make sense. And it's a much nicer way to look at things. Yeah. You know, and Rabbi Sachs, I think sort of owns that in his, in his writing. And he says, you know, we're very preconditioned by the way that Midrash addresses people and their character in Tanakh. And so Esav is, is made out to be bad for better or worse as a literary device or as, you know, a study of Midot. Um, but when he says, why does he, and that's like a perfect transition, Tammy, to say, right? Like he says, why would he want to be like Esav? We're so conditioned to say, why would he want to be like Esav? He's saving the birthright from Esav, right? He's doing this 
maybe noble, maybe sneaky thing to get something that he deserved. Um, but I think if we follow in this way of thinking that Yaakov wants to be like Esav, um, Rabbi Sachs argues he wants to be like Esav because Esav is like this, you know, I said like Yaakov is like the Nebi Yeshiva Bachar and Esav is like the, the tanned lifeguard at the beach, right? Like he's a skilled hunter, he's big and strong. Um, he, right, his bracha, the one that we talked about how Yitzchak knew that that was like a good bracha for Esav was one that in which his mother's sons would bow down to him and he would have wealth and, and um, power in the world. And I think probably most importantly, but in the middle chronologically is that Yitzchak loved Esav. And so as the second child, as maybe like a little bit more puny, a little bit more bookish, um, he, I could see, I, I got caught up in the narrative of thinking like, oh, maybe he does want to be like Esau, the, the one his father loves, the one who's big and strong and who commands respect out in the world. Um, so yeah, it, it certainly, it was new to me as well, but I think that there's something um, in which I empathize, I guess I would say, with Yaakov over this. So, so Rabbi Sachs, I only brought two um, paragraphs here, um, right? He explains the wrestling as Jacob's inner battle with existential truth. Right? Rabbi Sachs asks, who was he? The man who longed to be Esau or the man called to a different destiny, the road left less traveled, the Abrahamic covenant. I will not let you go until you bless me, he says to his adversary. The unnamed stranger responds in a way that defies expectation. He doesn't give Jacob a conventional blessing. You will be rich or strong or safe, nor does he promise Jacob a life free of conflict. The name Yaakov signified struggle. The name Israel, Israel also signified struggle, but the terms of the conflict have been reversed. And it is as if the man said to him, in the past, you have struggled to be Esau. In the future, you will struggle not to be Esau, but to be yourself. In the past, you held on to Esau's heel. In the future, you will hold on to God. You will not let go of him. He will not let go of you. Now, let go of Esau so that you can be free to hold on to God. Right? To me, that is like the most powerful line because I think it's so true of so many things in our lives. Right? Let go of Esau. Let go of the things that you can't be that are not authentic to you so that you can be free to do the thing that is authentic and is divine and spiritual and holy. And the next day, Jacob did so. He let go of Esau by giving him back his blessing. And though Jacob had now renounced both wealth and power, right, the brachot that Yitzchak had given to Yaakov posing as Esau, um, and though he still limped from the encounter the night before, the passage ends with the words, the, the uh, Yavo Yaakov Shalem, and Jacob emerged complete. That is the stunning truth at which Jacob finally arrived and to which the name Israel is testimony. To be complete, we do not need Esau's blessings of wealth and power. Ours is another face, an alternative destiny, a different blessing. The face we bear is the image we see reflected in the face of God when we wrestle with him and refuse to let go. So what I like about, about Rabbi Sachs is both this idea of like a divine wrestling but also this internal struggle to say, look, I tried for so long to be someone I wasn't, and now I'm gonna be the person that I'm destined to be, right? I, I think when we talked about uh, Yitzchak's brachot to his children before, we talked about how much better the covenantal bracha was, but I hadn't thought about it the other way, that in some ways it's like kind of a, a sad bracha compared to land and wealth and power, right? You'll get this like piece of land with people that you, you know, you don't know yet <laughs> that will never, you know, totally bow down to you, but they'll just be there with you. Um, and the covenantal bracha is like a little bit more abstract and a little bit more focused on the holy than the, the realistic and that it was tempting to want Esau's bracha for himself. But that being Shalem is saying, look, I'm not that person. And I'm going to let go of wanting to be that person, to be the person I'm really meant to be. Um, and so in that way, I, I felt like I found, oh, like I have a lot in common with Yaakov, right? How many of us have wasted years of their lives in high school or college or even now trying to be, I will say, like the tennis mom at the parking lot, right? Or the... <laughs> the person who knows more at the Parsha class. Um, there are so many people I sometimes pretend to be. And so I thought it was very empowering to think about letting go of Esau to be free to hold on to God. All right, I got Debbie, she's nodding. 
Okay, so that's that's punchline number one. Aviva Zornberg, who's even more wordy and beautifully eloquent um, than Rabbi Sachs, uh, who is also eloquent, but a little less wordy, also has like a long lead up to her punchline. So I'm gonna try to do the same, the same thing here so that we can have time to discuss both. Um, so um, Aviva Zornberg, I find often, I, I wouldn't say makes up words. I don't know if it's their real words or not, but she sort of, she doesn't feel bound by normative words. So she says that Yaakov's um, sort of, uh, my husband wants to call it behind handedness. He's speaking up from the scone making in the kitchen. Uh, she calls it his, his latenness or his, um, uh, what was the other word that she calls it? Um, that Yaakov, the uh, late lastness and lateness um, are her words for it. And that that is Yaakov's defining characteristic pre-wrestling match. Right, and we can see that, um, you know, we talked about Yaakov coming out on Esav's heel as wanting to be like Esav, but it is also just true that it's the achrei chen. Yaakov is last to the party outside of the womb, right? Um, and that could be good or bad. I, I don't, I, I think I give more negative meaning to it than Aviva Zornberg does, um, right? Uh, in this week's Parsha, we get the phrase, which some might know, acharon, acharon, hachaviv. Um, right, or Achron, Achron, Achaviva, um, because Yaakov puts his most beloved members of his family in order to the back of the, um, the parade that's going to meet Esav because he's trying to protect them from, from Esav. And so Rashi comments saying that, oh, Rachel is Achron, Achron, Achaviva. There's also maybe something patient about lastness and lateness, something where people are sort of looking to see before they enter the conversation, before they make a choice. Um, but there's certainly also something I think that is unavoidably negative about it in, in within our own interpretation in our text. When Esav is, is screaming in frustration after he realizes that uh, Yitzchak has given his bracha away to Yaakov, he says, right, hachi karashmo Yaakov ve'agveni ze pa'amayim. He has outwitted me twice. And it's a play on, on the name, right? The heel is also, it's like the last part of the foot. And so veyakveni means to outwit in this context. Um, there's something a little bit, I think, deceitful or sneaky about being last and late. Um, and even, we'll skip Lavan for one second, even um, Rashi notes on the pasuk where the angel says, this is your bracha, lo Yaakov shmech, right? Um, your name shall no longer be Yaakov, meaning that your brachot come to you ba'akava ubir mirma, right? And ba'akava is that same deceit or lateness and trickery, ki'im bisrara v'gilui panim. And so here, srara is translated as noble conduct, but it really just means like a more authoritative power, right? Sar comes from that authoritative open power, Yisrael, and Yaakov is about something maybe a little bit more hidden or more behind, behindedness, behind the scenes, lateness. Um, and then I think strikingly, um, when Yaakov is preparing to come meet Asab, he sends, he sends note from, um, from the, you know, I don't know, the midway point um, to Asab, and he's, he explains, Im Lavan Garti, I was with Lavan, the Echar, right? And there's that word again, and I was late, I was delayed, I was last, Ad Ata. And I heard a beautiful Dvar Torah when I lived in New York at, um, at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, probably when Rav Ari was assistant rabbi, um, from the now head rabbi, uh, Rabbi Stephen Exler. And he talked about how he is often late. Um, and that is sort of the culture of the HIR often is like not to worry too much about time. And he talked about how, why does it say adata? I was delayed until now. And he felt like that meant that Yaakov was in some way taking control. Right? When you have a bad habit, the first step is owning it with the people that it annoys, right? Okay, you're right, Esav. I was late until now. I was tricky until now. I was I was echar, uh, how, whatever that means. But now I recognize that. Now I'm going to move forward. And and Rabbi Exler quote, quoted a book by um, Rabbi Shmuel Klitzner, um, which is called Wrestling God. And he notes that the word echar is used seven times in this um, story about Esav and Yaakov meeting, right? The text is signifying in some way that Yaakov's lateness and lastness is very um, important. It's relevant here. 
<laughs> and so what's the turning point? For Aviva Zornberg, she suggests that the turning point is from going from the lateness and lastness, the deceitfulness perhaps, or the timidity of being last, to finding uh, open power. Um, and she notes that whether it's good or bad, it's just not working for Yaakov anymore. Right, Yaakov wants to actualize the brachot um, that were ordered that his father had given him, and he, she says, it begins to irk him. Right, it's like such a beautiful way of saying, like he's annoyed. Right, he's he's trying the same thing over and over. He's working harder, not smarter. Right, like however we want to think about it today, and he realizes that to be the person of power and authority, he needs something different than than his methods that he's used so far, and he is a deceitful person on many levels. He needs a capacity to confront and a passionate will that exposes one to loss and injury, right? I think Yaakov realizes he needs to be bold, more bold is, is kind of how I would say it. Um, and so the fight now becomes about that characteristic. So I'll, I'll pause for a second in case anyone wants to digest or add or say they don't like it, which is totally fine. I, I won't tell you the Zornberg. So, so I liked it, I will admit, I'm biased. Um, and so I, I, I want us to look at her punchline and then I'll deliver my punchline. Look at all the punchlines. Um, does someone else want to read? I feel like I'm tired of my voice, but if you guys aren't, I'm happy to keep going. Okay. Oh, oh, did I see you moving to unmute? <laughs> oh, oh, you're still muted, still muted. How about now? Beautiful. Another Midrashic tradition, however, suggests a more ambiguous identification. I shall not let you go until you tell me your name. And he called his name Israel, like the like own the angel's name, for his name was Israel. Right. So Aviva Zornberg is saying both Yaakov and the Ish are named Israel. Okay, keep going. In this reading, the angel has come for no hostile purpose but to save and rescue him. This angel is called Israel, perhaps because that is the purpose of his mission, to show Jacob in a therapeutic encounter how to become Israel. Since angels are named for their mission, this may be the reason for the angel's response to Jacob's question, what is your name? Why do you ask my name? Jacob already knows in himself the purpose of the angel's coming, for essentially he is facing himself. He desired, feared, necessity of a new name. He has summoned the angel to save him from the condition of being Jacob. The struggle between Jacob and the Israel principle has no unequivocal outcome. Two approaches to power, to authority, even to authenticity are mobilized here. Evenly matched, Jacob wants to prevail, to absorb into himself the power of his partner. He wants to become Israel by mastering the angel. The wrestling match is an occasion for clarification, for discovery of the parameters of personal power. Thank you. I don't know what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I often feel that way after I read Aviva Zornberg, but I yeah. think what she's saying is beautiful. So let's like take it apart a little and see if we can figure it out. Um, so I think um, here in this paragraph, right, she's making the case that the angel is has come on a mission. So she reads the Ish as an angel, right? Important first step, um, and that he has been sent by God, not for a hostile purpose, right, which we usually like associate with wrestling, but for a therapeutic encounter. And so the angel's mission is the same as his name, which I guess is like a well-known thing about angel theology, um, or I, you know, uh, tradition, is that angels often bear the name of their mission. And so the mission of this Ish in coming to wrestle with Yaakov is to teach him how to be Yisrael, right? One who is Sarita Imelokim Adam, or I forget the exact words up here, right? <coughs> Someone who is able to Sarita Imelokim Imanashim Vatuchal, right? Someone who can um, be bold and aggressive and assertive and strive with man and with God and to, to be victorious. That he doesn't have to creep around and wear furs to pretend to be Asav and lie to Laban and run away in the middle of the night. He can have some other way of like existing and operating in the world. And that that is the purpose of the angel. And he, and he has been summoned to, uh, and that, so that's step one. And then step two is that 
Yaakov wanted this, right? Yaakov was tired of being Yaakov. He was tired of using strategies that weren't working for him in leadership. And so he summoned the angel to save him from the condition of being Jacob, the condition of being late and last and behind and underhanded and deceitful and right, all the words that had started to become like almost, I would say, dangerously associated with Yaakov. So that's, that's I think, how she conceives of the wrestling match is it's um, Yaakov's inner battle with his own worst tendencies is maybe how I would say it. Um, and that Yaakov desperately wants to get rid of those tendencies and be someone who is a little bit different, a little bit more open, a little bit more bold. Um, but what I especially love about Aviva Zorinberg is that unlike um, Rabbi Sachs, who says, let go of Esau, become the person who holds on to God. And it's like a clear cut, liminal moment, right? Let go of one person, swing to the trapeze on the other side. I think that what Aviva Zornberg is um, acknowledging is that that is hard and maybe even impossible. The struggle between Jacob and Israel has no unequivocal outcome, right? Unlike Avraham, who goes from Avram to Avraham and is never called Avram again, Yaakov is both Yaakov and Israel for his whole life, interchangeably in many ways through Tanakh. And in fact, I don't know, I'd be curious uh, to see if it's different in Chicago or other places or other generations, but I would say the, the name Yaakov or Jacob is much more common than Israel or Israel. although my first cousin's name, first name is Israel, but he goes by Arye, his middle name, right? It's not like a name that is common in my experience. Um, and so I think what she's saying is that there, right, two approaches to power and authority are mobilized here. And Jacob wants to prevail to become Israel and that it's an occasion for clarification, right? It's a time to say, I have a lot of stuff going on and I have to choose a path and a method that's going to work for me for the rest of my life. Um, and it's about the parameters of personal power. So it's no longer about um, identity, maybe, right? Do I want to be more like Asaph or more like, like, a, like more like a non-Jew or more like a Jew? But it's about personal power. How do I want to use my inner strengths in the world? Do I want to be last and late or do I want to be bold and open? Sorry, just going mishap. Um, and, and that, that there's no unequivocal outcome. You know, that's, that to me is very striking about the difference between Aviva Zornberg and Rabbi Sachs's, um, uh, explanations. And I think that um, my punchline, if I were to have one, is that um, uh, Rev Soloveitchik um, wrote a beautiful essay called On Confrontation. And he references very briefly Yaakov and his, his wrestling match in saying that he thinks Jews have what's called a double confrontation. They have to be able to hold their place in the Jewish world and their place in the non-Jewish world. Like their place of being a Yaakov and their place of being a Yisrael, their place of being someone who wants to be an Esau and someone who wants to fight with God, right? That um, to be Jewish is to hold the double confrontation in two hands and to still the Yavo Shalem into the next place you go. And I think that um, I, growing up in Boston, going to my mom and these, that was like what I always learned was the hallmark of the Rav was this ability to ask a better question than to have an answer, that the answer might be a tension between two poles. And that's what I think that Aviva Zorinberg really embodies here, this no unequivocal outcome that we often wrestle and it's unclear what the answer should or <coughs> can be but that we can hold our, our, um, our different pieces of ourselves without feeling beholden to be all Yaakov or all Yisrael. And that that makes us Shalim, that that in some way completes us in a way that allows us to be more effective in our life moving forward. I don't know who I sold. It's hard to tell, faces far away on Zoom. They all look good. <laughs> I welcome thoughts, pushback, ideas. It's a quiet crowd tonight. <laughs> it's totally fine. No one has to have any ideas um, or ideas that they want to share with the group. Um, it's also a lot. I totally recognize that. Like these are two big heavy thinkers and I tried to boil them down into 30 minutes to combine. Um, so I guess what I would leave you with, uh, if no one wants to share anything, is that um, to be a Yaakov 
which I think like we all strive to emulate our, the midot of the avot and imahot in some ways. So, and we've talked about such admirable qualities, like right, and Abraham and able to like see God in the fire, and Sarah being able to laugh as a healing power, um, Yitzchak as being able to love, um, Rivka as being able to embrace Chesed, right? That <coughs> I think Yaakov offers us a harder choice of midot to to admire, and that actually to wrestle is a midah. and that's what I think is the commonality between Rabbi Sachs and uh, Aviva Zornberg that to be able to confront pieces of ourselves and want to change and want to grow and want to wrestle with ourselves and emerge victorious is a beautiful midah to emulate. And if I had to choose, it would be hard. I love that idea of letting go of Asav to hold on to God, but that having no unequivocal outcome should not defer you from the wrestling because that can leave you shalem in and of itself. And that would be, I guess, my breath to all of us, that there's like a lot of wrestling going on today and a lot of unknowns and things that we can't know what the right answer to. But if we can hold everything, one in each hand, and say, sometimes this is right and sometimes that is right, that we can emerge shelling. OK. Record time. Shabbat shalom. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Shabbat shalom. Good Shabbat to be back. Shalom. And are you going to be sending out those scones to everyone? In the <laughs> Honey, everyone wants scones shipped to Chicago now. <laughs> well, he's, he's throwing me a scone for you guys. <laughs> uh, we'll let you know how they turn out. Okay. Okay. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming.